first Sunday of the month, which means we put our, our focus and prayer on international missions. So I would remind you of the people group that we're praying for in the month of Bhutan that have not ever heard the gospel, um, that, or at least as far as we can tell, that they don't have anybody actively trying to tell them about Jesus, and so we want to pray for them. And then I would re remind you and continue to request that you be in prayer for those who are serving as, as missionaries and those who are striving to, to spread the gospel all across Eastern Europe. Uh, some folks in Ukraine, some, some folks at the Ukrainian Baptist Seminary, but then International Mission Board folks who are there on behalf of us as Southern Baptists, uh, who are there in Poland, who are there in the Czech Republic, who are there in, in many of these surrounding nations as well as some who are still in Ukraine and some who have had, who have had to evacuate uh, as they continue to try to spread the gospel and to share the love of Jesus with people in those situations. Uh, I would also ask you to be in prayer for efforts to spread the gospel in Russia. You may not know this, but one of the things that they passed in Russia several years ago is that they have laws restricting uh, the growth of religions that weren't present in Russia, and then they picked kind of an arbitrary date that stuck it back in the middle of the Cold War, when about the only religion that there was was the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, and there wasn't that much of that permitted by the communists, and so it very much restricts uh, gospel preaching churches. Like the Russian Baptist Union is heavily restricted in trying to spread the gospel. And so I'd ask you to be in prayer for our brothers and sisters in Christ uh, in Russia who are trying to spread the gospel and, and share God's love and truth with folks, uh, especially as things are going to continue to degenerate there. We think that we've got trouble and it is economically a pill to see gas prices be, you know, three dollar, almost three dollars a gallon more than it seems like they were two years ago. You know, two years ago we, we went in March and April of 2020, we hit this, nobody's going anywhere, nobody's driving anywhere, and gas got so cheap they were almost giving it away. And now, uh, you know, I, I, I really need a friend at the bank. I need a loan to, to fill up the car. You know, what's, what's your car? What's your car worth? Well, it depends on how much gas you got in the tank. You know, some of y'all's cars are worth a whole lot more because uh, you filled them up. Um, but the economic and the, the difficulty that's going to hit folks there as, as far as in Russia and Ukraine, the, the real just everyday people suffering is going to be stout. Um, and, and is getting you know, going downhill. Uh, one one example is this: Visa and Mastercard, for example, have stopped any operations in Russia. So if you had a Visa debit card, and that's how you were going to buy groceries uh, this week in Moscow, you can't. It's it's that simple, and you can't use your Visa card to go to an ATM to get cash because your Visa card just doesn't work. Uh, and it is in the midst of human suffering that proclaiming the gospel uh, tends to take the most root, where we're able to, to encounter people. You know, Jesus himself talked about that it is very hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And, and we know that. We see that. We feel that. Because when folks feel like everything's going fine and everything's great, we don't pray as much, we don't read the Bible as much, we don't depend on God as much. We tend to go, oh, we got this. Uh, so there are gonna be some, some major opportunities for us to see the gospel be carried to folks. Uh, and so we'll be praying for those opportunities to come and for the safety of those people who are making those opportunities even right now. Uh, you know, whether the, the risk is uh, death in the midst of a war zone or imprisonment uh, in, in the midst of, of a couple other countries. So just ask you to pray for those things, pray for those folks right now, uh, and then I'll lead us in the Lord's Prayer in just a moment. So let's pray.
you join me as we pray. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you take your Bibles and turn with me to Exodus chapter 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. You got snacks, right? Usually on, on, on Wednesday, Scott comes in from school and comes into the, the church office. Now we exchange, you know, pleasantries like, you know, hey, how was school today? He says, well, you know, it's fine, you know, you know, just a little bit of back and forth. He says, okay, so what are you, what's the sermon going to be Sunday? Because he wants to play music to go, to go with it or to correct it, just in case the sermon's a little bit off the rails. Uh, one way or the other, and he, he also has to, you know, he can also kind of go, okay, that, that one sounds dull, so we need to be a little bit heavier with the music, and, you know, that, that would be, you know, um, or that one sounds really dull, so let's go ahead and get folks asleep before we get started, but but anyway, he, you know, he has never said that or done that to me yet. We've only been at this a year together, though, as a team, so there's there's no telling where this goes in, in the coming in the coming years. He said, well, wh where are we going? And I was like, I'm having trouble with this one. And, and it's this, we could spend all the rest of the year in Exodus kind of plowing through this, and, and there's this tendency, us preachers have a tendency, once we get a good, a good sermon series started, we tend to not let it go. We tend to just kind of hold on to it, and we will ride that horse for as long as we can. Because one of the biggest challenges uh, in, in all honesty, you say, oh, but preacher, you know, you just pray and God tells you what to preach, right? Yeah, but that's a challenging, because, you know, on Monday, it's like, you know, I feel like maybe I should preach this. And then on Tuesday, I think I should preach this. Then Wednesday, this happens in the news. And, well, maybe we should go to, you know, maybe we should spend some time in Zechariah looking at locusts and all this kind of stuff. And then by Thursday, the way the world runs these days, by Thursday, you're in Daniel. By Friday, you're in Ezekiel. And on Saturday, you're going, I got nothing here. Got nothing left. We're at Peter and the world ending in fire uh, by the time you get to, by the time you get through Saturday. Um, so we tend to like to have a plan of what passage, and then we can study the passage and then present. This is what's going on there, um, and and then this is how this applies to, to your life. That's the goal in, in preaching. Um, and, and so we like to to run a series as long as we can because then it's just well, I preach this part of Exodus, then this part, then this part, then this part. Well, Exodus is 40 chapters. And there are parts of Exodus that we could spend, you know, two or three weeks because you got to get through the Ten Commandments to get through those 40 chapters. And if you can't get two or three sermons out of Thou Shalt Not Kill, then what are you, what are you even doing? I mean, you can, you can stretch that out because there's ways, for example, in which Thou Shalt Not Kill. You know, there are ways in which that applies to how we operate as a nation and therefore our politics and how we vote. There are ways in which thou shalt not kill applies to our economics and how you spend your money and what you do, what businesses you do and don't support. There are ways in which thou shalt not kill applies to where you should and shouldn't work. There are ways that that would apply to your personal choices. You know, I mean, about what you do with your life. You know, what, what do you do when the guy is beating on your door and wants to come in your house and take your television? You know, there, I mean, there's lots of sermon steps there. And then you take you take Jesus talking about that. And I tell you, you know, you've heard it said, thou shalt not kill. But I say to you, anyone who is angry with his brother has already committed murder in his heart. And so now we get to back up and we can take thou shalt not kill and talk about anger all day long. And, and then we're, you know, you're stuck with anybody ever not been angry. So we could spend a long time in Exodus, but then again, how many sermons on a plague of flies do you want to hear? I, probably one fewer than I want to preach. I mean, there's just certain things about that that aren't, you know, and, and it also leads to coming up with weird interpretations. Well, the flies stand for this, and, and you know. So 
The reason that we're going to cover 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and, and into 13, all in one, one fell swoop, is to get it, to, to get this big picture. Because next week we've got uh, a guest, and I don't know exactly what Aaron and I are going to do to, together in, in presenting and what he and Joanna are going to, going to do. We haven't worked all those details out yet. Uh, but we'll be away from Exodus, and then the next Sunday, it's time, you know, this is, we're closing out on Easter. It's time to start talking about Jesus going to the cross and to really put the focus in that direction. So we're going to wrap up Exodus. We're not even going to get to the Ten Commandments. You should know what the Ten Commandments are. If you've been in church most of your life, you should know. Have no other gods before him. Don't kill people. Don't commit adultery. I mean, you can really narrow it down. You know, there's, there's, you know, it's not hard uh, to, to read those, and then we can we can ask questions and talk about them some other time. But we do want to get the people of Israel out of bondage in Egypt. We don't want to leave them there. Uh, and that's partly because that's a good reminder for us. When God delivers us from sin. Jesus dying for our sins and raising up from the grave on the third day. He doesn't leave us there. God doesn't take us from our bondage to our sinful nature. God doesn't take us from our situation in life and then leave us trapped and alone. Now, he may leave us in the same job that we had beforehand. He may leave you with the same troublesome relatives that you had beforehand. He may leave you in the same house that you were living in. He may leave you in a lot of the external circumstances but he doesn't leave you spiritually bereft and trapped like you were. And so it's important that we don't fall back into it and fall back into this idea of, oh, well, I'll just never be able to really follow Jesus. Now, we will still trip and stumble. There will always be something to strive for. Uh, yesterday we were in downtown Little Rock. They've got stuff worked off for the Little Rock Marathon and Half Marathon that's going on. And you know, if, you, if you ever encounter one of those people crazy enough to try to run 13 miles in, in a day, I have a life goal. I will hopefully have run 13 miles in my life when my life is over. I know I covered like 12 in high school track. In, in PE when I was in the 10th grade. So I've only got about a mile left to, to fill out that goal for my life. But if, you know, when you encounter those folks, usually, you know, well, how to do it? Well, I, you know, either, well, I didn't quite hit my personal record, and so I know I could do better, or it's, well, you know, this time I set a, a new personal record, I'm going to push ahead and, and try to set another one next time. There's always a sense in which you can go and be better which is a valid way to look at it. After all, Paul compares living for Jesus with running for race. And so it's not that we say that, that God delivers us fully and so therefore we have no room for improvement. We, we always have room for improvement. But whether you run fast or run slow, you're a step ahead of the person who never chooses to get off the couch. And when we talk about salvation and God's deliverance, we need to realize that he picks us up off the couch and sets us to start walking. So in the Exodus, where we are is this. So far, Moses and Aaron have gone to Pharaoh, and that will all connect in a minute. Moses and Aaron have gone to Pharaoh and said, let the people go. And Pharaoh has said, no. And, you know, this gets dramatic when, when, when it's between Charlton Heston and Yul Brenner, and it gets dramatic, you know, let my people go. Go, Pharaoh, who is, who is the Lord that I should let his people go? And then the Lord says to Moses, okay, well, I'll show Pharaoh who I am, and I will strike him down, and I will strike down all of Egypt in the process. And, and when we look at that, an important place to look at and to remember is in the book of Genesis. You see, in the book of Genesis, one brother out of 12 ends up in prison in Egypt, having been sold by his brothers into slavery. And that brother has the ability to interpret dreams. God has given him that ability, and Pharaoh has a dream. And the message is this, there's going to be seven great years at the farm, and then there's going to be seven terrible years, and it's going to lay waste everything. 
when Joseph interprets that for Pharaoh, Pharaoh puts him in charge of the agriculture and of the planning to make sure that there's no, you know, that the death and destruction doesn't wipe out Egypt. And then we see in Genesis that through the course of that famine, that great wealth and, and power comes to the throne of the Egyptians. Because they're the folks with food and nobody else has it. And you could look at it and say at that point, Egypt manages to become the most important country on the block. They're the wealthiest, they've got the power, they've got the strength, because everybody else is nearly starved to death. But God, through Joseph, delivers the nation of Egypt. And so, when this Pharaoh comes around who does not know Joseph, he's also one who does not know the Lord and does not remember what God has done for the nation. And it's taken him about 400 years to forget. But one of the things that's about to happen through the course of all these plagues is that all of that goodness and all of that blessing that God had provided to the nation of Egypt, he takes away. When we forget what God has done, and when we use what God has done and provided for us, Selfishly, without compassion, without consideration for God's commands about loving our neighbor as ourselves, we have to expect that at some point God will take it away. And that when it goes, it will go fast. And it will be gone. And that's what happens. We begin in chapter 7. And first, Moses and Aaron do the whole put the stick on the ground and it turns into a snake and it's matched by the Egyptian magicians. And um, a, a question that you can ask one of the deacons later is how is, the, how is it that the magicians can do the same thing that, that Moses does? I mean, that seems pretty, pretty sketchy there. You know, where are the magicians getting this? There's two explanations for that. One is that it's within the realm of what the demonic is able to accomplish. And the other is that uh, it's the same way that any magician on the street, if you go over to the Maxwell Blade Theater in Hot Springs, Arkansas, and watch him do his show, you know, in all honesty, it's all an illusion. It's all a sleight of hand. Well, he's going, there's nothing up my sleeve over here. Look at my stick. Oh, look, there's a snake. He's pulling the snake out of his back pocket and throwing it on the ground. That is actually what I think, um, is that they're just faking. And, and they've come up with ways to fake it, but in the long run, and maybe they carrying snakes inside the sticks. I don't know. I mean, these guys aren't, you know, they seem pretty bright, but they're also kind of evil. So, you know, th that may be what's going on here. Uh, it may have been a common thing. Who knows? But this is what, this is what happens. And then we hit the first plague, which is where the Nile and all the rest of the water is turned to blood. Which seems pretty bad. But it goes downhill from there. It's important to remember what Egypt was. Egypt as a nation was considered, was called in the ancient world, was called the gift of the Nile. They are a country, they existed because there was consistent water, because of the flooding of the Nile and everything else. It was the source of life. And it's turned into a source of death. And then it gets worse. So you go from the Nile to frogs, which really shouldn't surprise that many folks because if the water turns to blood, the frogs are going to get out of the river and they're going somewhere. And so now they've got piles and piles of frogs everywhere. You say, well, frogs don't seem that bad. This is very true, except that frogs leave a mess. And they also represented, you know, there's a lot there with what ancient Egyptian religion held about frogs and, and such. And what you've got is you've got chaos happening. Because if you've ever tried, nobody who raises frogs, and there are people who farm frogs. That's how you go to the store and buy frog legs, okay? But you ever met a frog farmer? Or a frog herder that's like, oh yeah, we get them to move in, 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 in herds? 
You don't. Frogs are chaotic. Here in the first two plagues, God has struck out against, struck against two things that were very, very important to the ancient Egyptians. One was the Nile, and the second was an orderly, structured society. You see, most of their religion, a big part of it was this importance that there was chaos and it was held back by the power of the gods, which included Pharaoh. And now you've got frogs all over the place that you can't control, that you can't do anything about. And then when they die, you've got big piles of dead frogs. Then you've got gnats. And these are biting gnats. These are mosquitoes. These aren't just, you know, these are mosquitoes, buffalo gnats. They're just bad for you. Four, four, you've got flies. Again, you've got a slightly different one. These are you know, probably horse flies. I mean, y'all, this is the South. We know what bugs are like. They're unpleasant. Then you've got the, the cattle are struck dead. And one of the things that starts to happen here is that God starts to make, he says, I'll make a distinction between you, the Israelites, and the Egyptians. And so the Israelites, their stuff survives. The Egyptians, it's struck down. Then you get hail, which we often depict as burning hail. It's really not a very pleasant thing to have happen. You've got the boils. Um, you know, things are just getting worse and worse. And yet throughout all of this, neither Pharaoh nor the Egyptians are really yet ready to say, okay, the Israelites can go. Sometimes we think, well, it's surely somebody's life is so bad that eventually they'll, they'll, they'll turn back to God, right? And in all honesty, you think that, but sometimes that just causes you to dig deeper and to be that much more stubborn. I know that that doesn't affect anybody in this room, that you're just the kind of person that you would get more stubborn no matter, you know, the worse and worse things got. None of y'all are that way, but there are people that are like that, that the more it gets difficult, the more they just dig down harder. And that's what Pharaoh is doing. It's getting worse and worse. You've lost cattle. You've lost crops to the hail. You've lost things that have been eaten by the frogs. You've got people, you know, your own officials can't come before you because they're covered with boils. And he gets more and more stubborn. But again, we're not like that, right? We don't get more and more stubborn about, well, this is what we know God's will is, and this is what we know the Lord Almighty has said we are to do, and how He has said we are to live, and no matter how bad it gets, we're, you know, we, we don't turn our back on God's ways like that, right? Maybe sometimes we do. And, and, and we should watch out for that and not be as Egyptian as we sometimes are. And be willing to say, Lord, is what's going on here because of our unwillingness to do that which you told us to do? Then the locusts come. Which the good thing about the locust is, at least, you know, even if the locusts eat the stuff, then, then you can eat the locust, but you've got nothing left. And at this point, God has come through, and all of the wealth and all of the food reserves and all the habits that the Egyptians would have picked up from Joseph's time onward have been wiped out. They lost it. All the blessing that God had provided, 400 and something years worth. And it's gone, probably in the span of a month or so. It's not that long. You see, when we fall from following God, we tend to fall very, very quickly. It may take a long time to build, but it does not take that long for it to fall. And then the ninth plague, darkness. And there are several books about this, and, and it's, you know, when it's in the Sunday school literature, and, and you know, Pharaoh was considered the, the son of the sun god, and so this is a direct smite against Pharaoh, because after all, God takes away 
the, the light and, and leaves them in darkness. But I would suggest to you that it's even bigger than that. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void. And the Spirit of God was brooding over the, over the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light. There we go. All right, good. God said, let there be light. God, in his grace and in his creation, the first thing he makes is light. And in the ninth plague, he takes it away from the people of Egypt. This is where God says, that which I have given you, which is good, is gone. End of the darkness for all of you. And then the tenth plague comes. It's the death of the firstborn. This is going to be wide-reaching and, and wipe out a lot of what Egypt has. And we could spend a lot of time on this one because we don't really know exactly how to, to apply it. You know, how we, we tend to think of it as the part, partly we, we go back and we see Pharaoh ordering baby boys thrown in the river, and so we tend to think of it as applying, you know, under a certain age, but the scripture doesn't tell us that. This is the first one. Which means that if you're the firstborn son of the family, you know, and maybe at this point you're the main patriarch of the family, but you're 62. We don't know that it doesn't apply there. Firstborn sons would have been also leaders of, of government. They would have been leaders in, in military events. These are going to be the most important guys throughout all of Egyptian society. God's judgment is to destroy the nation of Egypt because the nation of Egypt has rejected him. But then he gives instructions. You see, in some of the earlier plagues, the plague of darkness, the plague of livestock, God says, I'll make a distinction between you guys, the Israelites, and the Egyptians. And you'll have light, and they'll have dark. You'll have cattle, and they won't. But when we come to the plague of the death of the firstborn, God says, there's going to be a distinction, but it's a distinction that's going to require you to respond. And then he gives the instructions. He gives the instructions for the Passover. And the Passover is a great place for us to come to because there's some things to, to see here that matter. First of all, in Exodus chapter 12, we get these instructions. He says, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month is to be the beginning of months for you. It's the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, they must each select an animal of the flock according to their fathers and families, one animal per family. If the household is too small for a whole animal, that person and the neighbor nearest his house are to select one based on the combined number of people. You should apportion the animal according to what each will eat. First thing we see is that God says, I'm gonna, we're going to do something, I'm going to do something that is so new and so different for you all that your calendar starts now. Now you may remember going back to Christmas that we talked about that the traditional historical church calendar starts with Advent as we come towards Christmas and that's the first of the, the church year in, in that sense. Well, the first of the year for the Jewish people in religion has, is the year is the month of the Passover. But the Passover itself is two weeks in. It's, it's on, on the 14th. He says, this could be so new that I want you to set, not set your watch by it, but I want you to set your calendar by it. Set your planner by it. This is where it starts. Right here and right now. Now, and, and, and one of the things that, oh, that we can pick up from this the Passover is to be eaten on the 14th of the month, but he tells them today's going to be the first of the year for you. So we know that there's two weeks of lead time at this point from where God gives this instruction to the day of the Passover. So there's lots of time to talk to folks about what's going on for word to spread. 
that this is what you're supposed to do. He says, here's what everybody's supposed to do. Go get for your house. Go get an animal. You're supposed to go pick out a sheep or a goat. Now, on down in the passages, it can be a sheep or a goat. It needs to be one of the nice ones. And if you don't have enough people in your household to eat a goat or eat a whole sheep, then you and your neighbor need to get together, and if that means that you need to pick a bigger one, then pick a bigger one, but that way you go in together. What we see in the Passover is that God doesn't just deliver the people of Israel so that each one of them individually can follow him, but he delivers them, and, and part of what he gives them is, and you're supposed to be in this, together. You're supposed to be in this together. We tend to think so much about me and Jesus got our own thing going and I'm okay without anybody else. But that's not ever the scriptural concept. It is always a, I have put you all together. Your household too small, your household too weak, they're not enough of you, you feel alone. That's what you got neighbors for. Go grab it. Household is too small for a whole animal. That person and neighbor nearest him are to select one based on the combined number of people. Throw them in together. Do things together. Work together. Because he's not just trying to build a whole people where there's a whole two and a half million Israelites, each one of them that relates to God by themselves. But they also have to live with their neighbors. They also have to live with one another. You must take an unblemished animal, a year old male, and you may take it from either the sheep or the goats. You're to keep it until the 14th day of this month, then the whole assembly of the community of Israel will slaughter the animals at twilight. Mm -hmm. Everybody count down to the sheep. Notice that it's with your neighbor, and then it's that all of us are going to do this together. And an important lesson here is that the kingdom of God is not made up of you as an individual, and him as an individual, and her as an individual, and there's all these different groups of individuals that someday we're going to stand before the throne of God and all be together. The kingdom of God is all of us together, but not just all of us within one church family, but the kingdom of God includes all of us who serve Jesus. It is not a bad thing to come together with other followers of Christ and say, you know what, all of us today are going to do this. For example, in about six weeks, all of us will celebrate Easter and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus all on the same day. All of them together. Then take some of the blood, put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses where they eat them. They're to eat the meat that night. They should eat it roasted over the fire along with unleavened bread and bitter, bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or cooked in boiling water, but only roasted over fire. Its head as well as its legs and its inner organs. Mm, Y'all were thinking about lunch, but now you're going, inner organs? Yeah. Eh, pass. You must not leave any of it until morning. Any part of it left until morning, you must burn. Here's how you must eat it. You must be dressed for travel, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you're to eat it in a hurry. It is the Lord's Passover. So he says, this is what you're supposed to do. You need to grill this, cook it over an open fire, you know, it's a rotisserie sheet, and then set on it like a pack of teenage boys after a hard day in yard work. Don't leave any anything that's left you're supposed to burn in the fire and there's a lot there's probably some some additional symbolism here that we don't want to don't need to, to spend a lot of time on but it's this it is the main thing you're supposed to eat it and be ready to move on that's why he says you know eat it you're supposed to stand it you know you're supposed to be dressed for travel lean it on your staff ready to go this is not a, a kick back and relaxed meal this is a let's eat and be ready for what god's going to do next he says, I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, strike every firstborn male in the land of Egypt, both people and animals. I am the Lord. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt. The blood on the houses 
where you're staying will be a distinguishing mark for you. When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. No plague will be among you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Here's how I'm going to make a distinction. Those of you who trust in faith that I'm going to do this and who will follow my instructions, I'll pass over and nothing bad will happen. And I'll destroy those who disobey. And if you're the people of Israel, one of the parts of trust that you have to have at this point is to realize that if you put the blood of that lamb on your door for the Lord to pass over, that in the morning, your Egyptian neighbor, the guy down the street who just lost his firstborn and his firstborn cow and his firstborn horse and everything else, and who is angry and sad all at once is going to look up the street and realize you're one of them. And what's going to have to happen is that your fear of the Lord has got to be greater than the fear that you have of your neighbors. Your fear of the Lord has to be greater than the fear that you have of the world around you out to get you. Because ultimately, that is a part of our decision that we have to make. What's more, what are we more concerned with? The people out there or the Lord above? Are we more concerned with what somebody's going to say about us or do to us? Or are, we, or are we concerned about obeying what God has to say? Because, see, there's unhealthy fear and there's healthy fear. It's a healthy fear to realize that there is a great and all-powerful God. But that's a healthy fear. That if we don't walk in obedience to him, that judgment would fall. That's healthy. It's also healthy to realize that in his love and in his mercy, God has given us plenty of ways to not be judged by him. That's a good thing. Fear of the people around us, that'll hamper us from walking and following what God has told us to do. So he tells them to do this. He says, This day is to be a memorial for you. You are to celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. You are to celebrate it throughout your generations as a permanent statue. You're to celebrate the day God laid waste to the land of Egypt? Yes, you are. Why? Because when he did so, he delivered you in the same way that we celebrate that the Son of God put on flesh, dwelt among us, lived a perfect and sinless life, and died for us. Why? For two reasons. One, because he didn't stay dead. Two, because since he died for us, rose up from the grave on the third day, we can be delivered from sin. And we celebrate that. As much as we should mourn over our sin that required Jesus to die, we should celebrate the fact that he chose to. And then he gives them some instructions. You're supposed to eat unleavened bread for seven days, get the yeast out, all of these things. Uh, and when you're supposed to do this, Moses passes this information on. Skip on down to verse 24. Keep this command permanently as a statute for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you, as he promised, you are to observe this ceremony. When your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? You are to reply, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord. For he passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and spared our homes. So the people knelt low and worshipped. Then the Israelites went and did this. They did just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. Which this may be the last time that they actually do exactly as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron, but they at least did it this time. Okay? When you read the rest of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you're like, did these people ever do the right thing? And you go, no, not really. But they get close. But notice what the purpose is. One of the purposes of that memorial, of that every year. It's so that they always remember, and it's to drive the next generation to ask questions. Why do you do this? And then to answer. It's because this is what God has done. Now sometimes we kind of slip up, and, and, it's, and it's worth asking that question. Well, why do we do this?
The answer ought to be able to come from our heart because it helps us to remember. Why do we cut down a tree and stick it in our house in the middle of winter? As a reminder of growth and the evergreen nature of the grace of God. Why do we give our kids empty plastic eggs at Easter that they thought had chocolate in them? It's to remind them of the empty tomb and also the tax that has to be paid to the parents of the chocolate. Some of, you, some of y'all didn't parent right, apparently, because you probably gave the chocolate to your kids at that time, in that time frame. Uh, but why, why do we do this? Why do we, you know, why do we as Christians, why do we put a cross up? To remember that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that we are crucified with Christ, and yet we live. Why do we baptize? Why do we do this? We ought to do stuff as Christian people that causes folks to ask that question. Why do you do this? And rather than backing up from the question going, you know, uh, I don't know. We ought to know the answer. And then out of our hearts, we ought to be able to answer that question. Why do we do this? We do this for this reason. Because it reminds us, because it helps us tell the story. You see, if the answer is, why do you do this? And we say, well, because we've always done it that way. That's a terrible answer. It really is. Because it's meaningless and it's empty. It just says that, well, we just don't want to change anything. But why do we do this? Well, because for 200 years we have believed and taught this. This is part of our connection and our heritage. Why do we drink a small cup of grape juice and and eat a small cracker? as a reminder that we're all part of the body of Christ, that Jesus broke, his body was broken for us, his blood was poured out for us. That's why we do it. Not because we always have, but because Jesus taught us to, and because it means this to us. Why do we sit in this way? Why do we do this as a church? Why do we do these things? We ought to know those answers and be able to pass that on. See, the Exodus, what God does here, he does a couple of things all in one bundle. Number one, he judges the Egyptians for refusing to acknowledge him. Number two, he honors his promise to the people of Israel to deliver them from their bondage in Egypt and to give them the land that he promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it's a lot of land, especially if you cover it on foot. I mean, you may think... Not that much, you've got a four-wheeler, but they didn't have four-wheelers, okay? A lot of land. A lot of space. Number three, he equips the people of Israel with how to teach the succeeding generations, the folks that come after them, about who he is and what he does. And from those three things that he does in the Exodus, all in one long, we ought to learn that this is the God who judges unrighteousness. The God of the universe judges unrighteousness. And he judges it severely. God does not take sin lightly. He never has. He never will. Sin is an affront to his holiness. It is an affront to his righteousness. And he stands in between him and his love for his creation. God will always judge sin. And he will judge it based off of how it affects eternity. We tend to want God to judge sin based off of how it affected this week. But he judges based off of how it affects eternity. Number two, we should learn that God has a plan to fulfill and and fill out his promise. He promised that he would send a redeemer for all mankind. You find that promise given to Abraham too. You find that promise given to Eve. We find that promise fulfilled in Jesus. That God has given us that. And God has given us the ability to pass that that on, that, that story, that truth forward to the people that come after us. And it is for us 
to pick up what he is said to do, to take up the word of God and to pass it on. It is good and right and fitting that we gather together and we sing worship songs about Jesus. We sing worship songs to Jesus. That's a part of the things that we can do that cause God, cause other people to say, why do you do that? Why do you get up on Sunday morning? Beautiful day out there. You could have been fishing. Why'd you go to church instead? And to be able to pick that up and say, because God put me in a family that gathers to worship Him. But it is never the end point of following Jesus that we come to church and sing great songs. The end point of following Jesus is that we go out and proclaim his glory among the nations. That we go out and make disciples. That we go out. Because the best part of the book of Exodus comes up Verse 38 of chapter 12. A mixed crowd also went up with them. And, and there's a lot said in just a few words about that mixed, with what that mixed crowd is. It wasn't all people descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There were other people that had seen what God had done and said, we want that. We don't want Egypt anymore. The high point end point. The goal is this. That crowd includes our neighbors that we go to and say, come with us as we follow Jesus. That we would do that. That the kingdom of God would go forward and be well known and, and more and more would come to that point that they follow Jesus with all their life. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. We ask you, Lord, to help us to serve you well in all things. It's in Jesus' name we pray.